Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, good night, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear speakers, dear delegates, uh, dear Dr. Frank Richter, uh, thank you for organizing and giving opportunity for us uh, to discuss uh, our topics during the Horasis Asia event. And uh, I think uh, here we will discuss a very important issue for the whole world. Everybody now facing or directly or indirectly uh, also the consequences of this problem of the existing COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, as we know, uh, billions and dozens of billions of dollars directly spent on research. Uh, how we could avoid or be better prepared for the next pandemic? I'm not talking about uh, more or less dozens of trillions of dollars uh, spent in fighting with the pandem COVID-19 pandemic and the consequences of this pandemic. And now we will discuss a uh, quite philosophical question. Uh, should we continue trying to prepare uh, and uh, trying to avoid the next pandemic and spending billions of dollars now and potentially hundreds of billions of dollars, hundreds, or Otherwise, we just sit and wait and, uh, when the problem will happen, and then we'll decide what to do. Uh, because uh, uh, in the today's difficult economic situation, uh, with the economic crisis uh, caused by the pandemic, of course, it's not easy for the governments to allocate uh, big money, big funds for the preparedness and uh, uh, of the something for, for some event in the future. And uh, some of them, of course, they would like to spend money right now to support the population, to support people, to support economies. And I would like uh, uh, that you will share your views on this problem. Uh, what, uh, what, what is your opinion? What, what are your ideas? What are your suggestions? Uh, how we should move in that direction? I will uh, in, uh, introduce myself. I am Murat Sietnipesov, Chairman uh, of the Caspian Week Forum and the president of the Greater Caspian Association. Later on, I will come back to the epidemiology uh, because uh, uh, we are also developing one interesting, I think, project uh, in the digitalizing epidemiology, which will also deal with the preparedness for the next pandemic. But uh, now I would like to introduce our speakers. Uh, first, uh, we have Virginia Colodon, Executive Director, your public value from Germany. Uh, then Jan Liu, co-founder and chief executive officer of BioCaptivate in the, from United States. It's already quite late time in the United States, and thank you, Jan, for joining the session. Uh, then Luis Metzger, uh, uh, he is co-founder and chief executive officer of the Deep Views in, in, from United States. And uh, Mikhail Trevish, president of Great Universal Crowdsourcing Agency from Russia. And uh, Kerry Cummins, founder Min uh, Mind Bar Germany. Okay, uh, first uh, I would like to ask Virginia, uh, the floor, floor is yours, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Murat. Uh, as you said, I'm a transformational uh, coach and also executive director of Your Public Value, which is a four year old uh, NGO based in Berlin. Um, my background is from global nonprofits and multi agencies. So I've been working a lot on finding consensus and working with uh, people from uh, all over the world to try to find common um, approaches and common messaging. And this pandemic is actually quite telling for all of us as citizens, as business people, as representative of states. And there are several lessons that I think we can uh, actually explore uh, looking at the new wave that is hitting uh, a lot of us uh, these days. And if you allow me, as I'm the first uh, speaker, just focus on some of the lessons while we are still fighting this current pandemic before even thinking of the future ones. I think it's a current state. And I, uh, I really believe, listening to all scientifics, that it's going to be one after the other. So there is a request to uh, explore the lessons, but also accept the situation and try to find uh, collectively 
new uh, ways to uh, to function. So you said I'm the executive director of your public value. What is public value? It's not a new uh, concept. It was created at the Kennedy School uh, 27 years ago. So again, the Americans uh, are really working with us. And basically, it considers that society and the environment are both active stakeholders of any company, any corporation. And so it may seem very clear now because we have had this uh, disruption with climate change, but 27 years ago it was not. And to tell that society of a role is an active stakeholder and not only your customers, not only your uh, not only your ambassadors, not only those who really believe in you, but everyone, including the invisible. This one is still in many uh, corporate strategy, a new, uh, a new thinking. So the, even if we accept that society, meaning communities and the environment, the natural environment are active stakeholders, how do we actually continue to be financially sustainable because we're not talking about philanthropy right we are actually are discussing incentives it's very important for prof for for business to maintain profit because what we're looking for is basically a triple bottom line that's what we need we need financial sustainability environmental sustainability societal environmentality and today with um with the the new uh with the covid-19 we see this extremely important gap between the developed countries and the non-developed countries this is huge the un came up with a report in september uh the conference on trade and development and it's showing uh actually that the vaccination rate in low developed countries is only 2% when it is 41% in developed countries. And even though more than 50 countries um, have less than 25% than of their population vaccinated. Okay, so we have the countries that have the lowest income have the lowest vaccination rates. And of course, this is a danger for uh, the overall uh, state, uh, a global state, we are going to be vulnerable uh, from a health perspective if we continue to have places, some 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 countries on the world where the where the COVID can actually grow and feel totally free. So we have to switch to uh, a global mindset and. The incentive, as I was saying, and I'm, I'm finishing, Moha, the incentive is actually a, a change of mindset. And it's important in each corporate strategy to actually consider in a long-term perspective those who are not immediately concerned by our product, our service uh, in our industry. If you can, t if you are able to change this mindset, change the approach, consider society and the environment as active stakeholders, then you are only then are you able to bridge profit and the common good and to avoid uh, this feeling that we have today of greenwashing, to avoid the state or the corporate marketing, only words. So there are tools for that, there are public value tools, and it's very important to uh, think global and to think differently. So the risks are global. We can see it with COVID. They remain and they will remain global. And so only with, um, I would consider public value, with considering society, the environment as active stakeholders, can we actually bridge uh, that, uh, that risk? Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to Jan Liu, uh, founder of the BioCoptivate Captivate Think Tank from the United States. Please, what do you think on this? Uh, on Hi, um, my name is Jan. Um, my background is in cell and molecular biology, but now my focus is on changing the culture and the narrative, the human relation part of science. 
So I think that um, the world is suffering under the illusion that science is progressing in an optimal rate. And I believe that's just not the case. If the scientific enterprise, the academia try to communicate to the world as if like, science is doing just fine, all it needs is just more funding and more money, but it does not have internal problems such as structural problems or management problems or uh, philosophical, ideological problems. Like if the world does not know that there's a gaping gap of what is missing, what needs to be done, that science is imperfect, then why would they want to fund science? Why would they want to spend more money on life-saving drugs if they don't know that those drugs are missing? So, I mean, we have all these amazing COVID vaccines and all this. It is despite of, not because of the current system problem of science. So if we want to change the, the situation and we want to make sure that um, the general public, the decision makers will be willing to fund science and fund life-saving drugs, then we need to have new blood in science. We need to have next generation of scientific leaders and communicators who are willing to challenge the existing narrative, who are willing to bridge the understanding gap, who are willing to speak to the public and decision makers about what is actually wrong about science. And first, we can create mutual understanding and the, the collective belief that this, um, it is a necessity to fund science. That's it. Thank you, Jan, and thank you to be very uh, short and brief because uh, we have five speakers. And uh, now, uh, finally, Luis uh, Mesger was able to join. Uh, he's the CEO of the DBUs, uh, incorporated from the United States. As, you, as we see on the background, it's quite late in the United States. Thank you for joining, despite the right time. Please, uh, we would like to hear your view on the situation. And uh, as uh, we discuss the main question, should we spend the budgets and money now and uh, for preparing and trying to avoid the next problem which is unknown now what is the problem or we better sit and wait and then when the problem will happen then we will deal as is what do you think and what are your ideas well uh, thanks for having me and there's the difference between what we should do and what is human nature to do i think it's often human nature to kick the can down the road as long as possible invest minimal resources and hope for the best but as we've seen with uh, COVID-19, that, that wasn't sufficient. I think we've, we've caught up in some ways uh, remarkably quickly uh, as a result of the pandemic in terms of surveillance of novel pathogens. But I think that sustained investment is necessary and really a few different types of, of sustained investment. So university research helps us solve some of the long-term pro problems in infectious diseases and and find better ways to, to survey what, what pathogens are evolving. But at the same time, that university research really needs to be partnered with industry. And by industry, I mean everything from pharma to logistics companies. And really, as we've seen, logistics has, has uh, been a very difficult thing in terms of developing vaccines and distributing those vaccines. Uh, and then when we look at supranational, uh, national and supranational entities, I think that those need to be strengthened. Uh, this is an expensive project, but one that I think if we invest in now, when we have novel bacteria, uh, which are proliferating, or novel strains of bacteria that are drug resistant, when we have uh, parasitic pathogens, think malaria and Chagas disease, and when we have other viruses, we'll be better set up to, to address those. And, and so it's really a multimodal approach, and we need very clear interaction and good collaboration between academia, industry, and governments, both national and I think even more importantly, supranational. Thank you. Uh, can, uh, can you also a little bit tell us about your background, how you came oh, to yes. the uh, Yes. So, so my, uh, my background is I led an infectious disease uh, small molecule drug discovery team at Novartis Pharma uh, for a number of years, and we had a strong infectious disease program. Uh, since then, I've, I've worked in, in smaller biotech companies and now in investing uh, in looking at 
how do we find that next wave of biotech startups that are doing uh, impactful work in in the sciences and and in particular I, because it's it's my research interest and close to my heart how do we deal with novel pathogens and incentivize people who are working on on the discovery of those pathogens and and how to treat them thank you luis i think it's very interesting we'll come back to the uh, next pathogens, uh, dangerous pathogens, a little bit later uh, when we'll discuss, uh, do the brainstorming discussion. But now I would like to give the floor to uh, Michal Trevish, who is the founder and CEO of Omnigrade Crowdsourcing Agency. And uh, uh, first of all, please uh, tell us a little bit about your background and uh, also important what is your crowdsourcing agency is doing and uh, how it's related to the pandemic or the existing one or the future ones. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Th thank you, Marat. Uh, um, I spent quite a lot of time in Asia. Uh, I used to be the chairman of uh, Asian chapter of International Practice Group for almost 10 years. Uh, but now I am founder of, um, as you mentioned, I am founder of Omnigrid Crowdsourcing Agency, and we are trying to use uh, uh, the intelligence and creativity and imagination of uh, communities of voluntary experts, of crowd, in order to find uh, some outstanding solutions to the most complicated business issues of different companies and organizations. But also we are trying to use the intelligence and imagination of the crowd in order to find solutions to the most serious challenges that humanity uh, uh, faces now or uh, could face in the near future. And one of our projects, uh, we call it uh, the city of the future, is uh, to, to try to find the solutions of the uh, problems and issues that uh, the urban residents will face in the future. And one of the most important uh, problems, of course, is how to prevent or increase the risk of the future epidemics and pandemics. So I have already some first results uh, of the discussion among uh, volunteer experts. So I'd like to share very briefly with you, and uh, un uh, I can answer to your question uh, based on this results. The question about do we need to prepare to next pandemics in advance? The answer is yes, but it, we don't need to spend a lot of money for, for this. Uh, so it's not necessary. Maybe it, we do not need, need to spend about tens of hundreds of billions of US dollars or euros, because some solutions are very similar uh, are very simple. Just for instance, start from education system. Uh, the spread of uh, pandemics depends on the, on the behavior of the people. So if you can uh, launch some educational uh, uh, courses, say on epid epidemiology, for, school, uh, uh, for schools, for universities, for urban residents, it will be, uh, you will be able uh, to improve the behavior of uh, residents and uh, to decrease the spread of uh, pandemics. Another important point is that you can create more comfortable conditions for remote work. So if the majority of city residents will have remote work or maybe some hybrid regime when you can spend, say, uh, two days in the office or, or three days at home working, uh, you will decrease the concentration of people in public transport system, and also you will decrease the spread of next pandemic. So if you uh, uh, spend some resources in order to uh, create such comfortable conditions for remote works, you will have win-win situation because you will make the uh, life of uh, future generation of city residents more comfortable because it's very stressful to spend uh, several hours in public transport uh, to go from home to work and vice versa, from work to home. But also you will make uh, uh, the life of people uh, more safe because you prevent the, uh, ma ma many of people, many of city residents from future viruses or existing viruses and um, uh, other um, uh, sources of uh, diseases. Uh, so you can imagine some not very costly but very efficient solutions 
which can be implemented in different countries, different regions, different cities, and even different villages, which can uh, substantially reduce the risk of future pandemics. And we need to, because now we realize that this threat, the threat of future pandemic is very high, uh, we need to think about it every day. So this is my uh, very brief answer to your question. Uh, thank you, Mikhail. Uh, but I have uh, another question for you. Uh, yeah. Because uh, we have here a little bit uh, two different approaches. Uh, maybe first approach is to catch the pandemic on the earliest possible stage and try to block it on the earliest possible stage. And this was successfully done, by the way, with several uh, new dangerous viruses in Africa. I think Luis could comment on this more than me. Like uh, there were like uh, dozens of hundreds of cases. Although uh, these viruses, they were much more dangerous than COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2, which caused the COVID-19 pandemic. But they were isolated in Africa in the several villages, and then we didn't have any pandemic. Uh, what is your proposing? It's very interesting, uh, but uh, this will be useful if we will already have dangerous virus spread it over the world and then how to reduce the consequences. Am I right? Yes, it's true. But if you're speaking not about today, but about tomorrow, I think that the situation even in Africa in 10, so, uh, in 10 or 20 years future will be different. Because you mentioned that uh, you mentioned African villages. But I think that most of human population in the world will live in cities in, say, 20 years future including Africa. Today, a rural population in Africa is much bigger than urban population. So if people will be concentrated in big cities, it will be much more uh, difficult to uh, prevent the spread of pandemics. So if we have, of course, I completely agree that we need to try to prevent the spread of pandemic at the very beginning, if it is possible. But we also need to be prepared to uh, pandemics which uh, started already to spread around the world. And we, so we need to think about two cases, how to prevent the pandemic and how to reduce the spread of pandemic. Yeah. And if we concentrate only on one issue and forget about another issue, it will be not a good choice. Yeah, yeah, I think. No, no, you are, uh, yes, your solutions or proposals are mainly concentrating on how to, uh, like, reduce uh, negative consequences from the pandemic. Uh, on, the, on the first glance, it's very simple solutions uh, and <laughs> very, uh, 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 yeah, well, epidemiological education and remote work and uh, try to uh, remove people from the big cities, which is naturally already going on. I have some friends in the United States, and they're now, for example, from New York moving out because they don't yeah. want to stay in the city. And also in Europe is the same. Uh, but on the other side, is uh, it could be quite costly exercise uh, because if you are touching so many people, change their habits, it could be even more costly than uh, other solutions. But I agree that uh, this is, uh, these are very good proposals, and uh, one side quite simple, on the other side could be quite effective. Okay, now I would like uh, to give the floor to Kerry, Kerry Cummins, CEO and founder of MindBar. Please uh, tell us a little bit about your background and uh, uh, also your ideas and what we should do. Please. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm uh, an American living in Germany. I'm the founder of the MindBar. The MindBar is a place that um, where we help corporate teams, um, also individuals, as well as schools, um, with stress management and also uncover unhelpful thought patterns um, that keep people stuck and teams stuck in, in finding solutions to problems. Um, and so my, back, my personal background is um, pretty colorful. I, I have um, an MBA. I'm an ex-management consultant. Worked for years for Fortune 500 companies um, consulting them on strategic management subjects. Um, and I also have a, a master's in psychology. I work as a trauma therapist in a clinic. Um, something I just, it's kind of, I, I just, I know this sounds strange, but I enjoy doing. Um, I also um, work as a coach. So um, where we 
do work in a team um, and we use a variety of um, cognitive behavioral approaches, mindfulness approaches, mental training tools to get people unstuck out of their not on very unhelpful um, thought patterns, usually based on fear. So um, we have different programs that we use um, and it's a various mix of tools, coaching, and talk therapy. Um, and on the subject today, I think that we need to focus. I, I also agree with Virginia that we're still in this pandemic. And I think there's a lot of work to do right now, um, especially on the psychology of the pandemic. Um, you know, we have, there's obviously there's different topics here. There's um, low vaccination rates in not only less developed countries, but in developed countries, um, it's not high enough. Um, we're seeing that in Germany right now. Um, the numbers are increasing very, very rapidly. Um, and one of the reasons, and this is where I come from, this, this approach is the psychology of the pandemic. There's a lot of resistance and it's based on um, information and education. And so I think that one major, major um, focus needs to be on educating the public on science. Um, so I think we're kind of on the same wavelength here. We need to ed educate what is science. We need to um, have a, some kind of global educational um, group collaborating with each other to get everybody on the same page as to what do vaccinations do? How do they work? What, how, what is the status of the research? Um, there's a lot of fear, and that is the main reason why, the, in, at least in the developed countries, the vaccination rates are so low. There's um, um, mixed messages and misinformation also based on social media, and I think there's, that's a huge project that needs to be worked on uh, right now and definitely for the future. Uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, I think we have more or less consensus that uh, we should not sit and wait and try to be prepared and spend some budget and spend some efforts. If we'll have this uh, decision, we, we should we should make. Uh, but uh, first question is uh, which budget, uh, which efforts, and then also there are different stages of preparedness uh, for the next pandemic. I will just name some of them. And then we think uh, where we should concentrate, because I, I've had different opinions. And uh, first, first is a prediction, how to predict the next pandemic. Uh, second is how to detect the dangerous pathogen, which could cause the next pandemic. Uh, then how to prevent spread, uh, spreading of this dangerous pathogen, virus, bacteria, or the special proteins, and so on. Uh, then the uh, next stage is uh, dealing with the consequences like lockdowns, how to optimize the actions of the governments, how to optimize, uh, optimize uh, the healthcare systems. And then we have even after effects, like psychological help for the victims of the pandemics, uh, not one, but the future ones, and, uh, and many other stages. And uh, question for all of you, which stage or stages uh, we should concentrate first, because if the budget is limited, if budget is unlimited, of course, we can do both simultaneously at the same time. But uh, what do you think, uh, like say, certain governments or international organizations or multinational companies should allocate budget for with which priority from these stages? Or maybe you have some other ideas on the stages, please. Uh, starting from Virginia. Thank you. Um, thank you, Murat. I agree with these stages when we talk about the future pandemics, but actually the point of uh, invisible threat is that we cannot really plan because we don't know where it's coming from. So we are currently in, in a state of extreme vulnerability for all the, uh, for all the, the, um, okay, I'm sorry if a um, word in Russian comes because I'm, yes, from, okay. all the, <laughs> from all the layers 
uh, so for government, for business, for the population. So I think uh, we have to really embrace this complexity and continue to be innovative, each of us in a, in a, uh, a field. So predict, detect, prevent, and deal with the consequences I hear uh, the issue coming from uh, from the state, yes, and, and from science and from multilateral organizations. That's what um, the World Health Organization should do together with the states. But if you are uh, a business, a big business, and if you're a pharmaceutical company, you should do that. But if you are any big business, you also have uh, a responsibility and you can to, to avoid big risk to, to stop you. So depending on your field, you also have the responsibility to look at what could actually come as an unexpected risk. And this is why Carrie and me are talking about psychology and mindset, because you really need to change uh, the way you build your strategy Taking new stakeholders in advance, that's my, my, uh, actually, uh, piece of, uh, of information, but so that you consider new, uh, threats or new people. And the best example here are the yellow jackets in France. You can say it, I'm French. No one would have seen them. Uh, the French state did everything by the book. Uh, the sustainability experts told them you have to have a carbon tax so that you can invest in new energies. They did that, and guess what? It cost billions of euros to the state and to each of us French uh, taxpayers. And it's not over, people are angry. So these invisible stakeholders, they exist, but we don't see them. So what do we do? We just ask, we consider everyone, and we do it at a global level. Thank you, Virginia. Just one comment from my side here. Uh, you mentioned WHO, uh, which is a great organization and trying to do their best uh, to fight with the existing pandemics. But what I see from their side is a lack of actions on the preparedness for the next pandemics. Uh, because now they're overloaded uh, by the existing problems. They're dealing with the vaccination issues, with the treatment protocols, with the recommendation and so on and so on. Looks like their resources are fully utilized. And it means uh, that uh, if uh, they utilize for their resource for existing problems, somebody should think about the future problems. And uh, uh, can, it's a resource issue, so it's a citizen issue, it's a state issue. If the states agree to give more uh, resources to WHO for future pandemics, they actually can do it. It's not a, a question of whether they can or not. It's how we all think. And so the states don't give more uh, finances. You know how multilateral organizations function. They are dependent on the overall risk uh, vision uh, of each of us, citizens, and then the states. Uh, here, also one final comment, <laughs> because I, I know you are in that field and uh, you are from, from multilateral. Uh, you have very good, uh, b b extensive background on these multilateral relations. That's why I would like to continue the discussion uh, about WHO. The, for example, in May, uh, WHO, together with the German government, announced the creation of the hub for ep epidemiological surveillance. And the German government gave 30 million euro. Today is uh, practically December. Uh, after seven months, I didn't see really some tangible results. And looks like here, it's not a problem of uh, money. It's a problem of mobilization because uh, for I know how international organizations are working. The like, decision-making process is quite slow. And on the contrary, in the private sector, a decision-making process uh, could be, okay, I will not tell in minutes or hours, but you can make some strategic decisions or days or weeks time, not years. And here I see the big potential for public-private cooperation, even okay. on the epidemiology, even on the preparedness for the next pandemic. Uh, yeah. This is just uh, additional comment. Please, Jan, uh, I think, your um, ideas. Okay. One thing is that we should focus on uh, increasing the capacity and infrastructure of amplifying and rapidly developing therapeutics and vaccines, because it is not enough to have the good uh, medicine or, or the vaccine, but if you cannot like 
rapidly churn out a lot of them for the people then like in a very fast manner then it won't do as much good or it won't really solve the problem so that that rapid scaling capacity is important that um frequently that people uh, forget to think about that but the second thing is like this is not just a business problem this we can also see that as like building cathedrals or like space technology moon landing so there's something that it's almost like both ideology and and even religion or, or vanity that like so if we see that it's a single matrix problem then like we will only fight try to solve that with one method method but if we see that as a um, multi-module problem then we can solve that in a much faster and because we can solve that so many ways uh, thank you Jan. now Luis, please well, the, the, your your question is difficult because the, the the question is where to focus, and I'm torn in how to answer that. But I would say that uh, early detection is important, and that's not just for viruses. I I think we really should be thinking about drug resistant bacteria, and about uh, you know fungal pathogens and and parasitic pathogens. So you know this really does cause a high disease burden throughout the world. All these different types of infectious diseases. And one item of good news is that uh, next generation DNA sequencing technologies are becoming really good, but they're also becoming cheap and they're also becoming portable. And most importantly, as others here have mentioned education, they're not quite there yet, but we're getting to a point where sample, sample prep uh, uh, from the field or from medical clinics wherever can be somewhat turned into a kit. Uh, such that people without advanced training in molecular biology might still be able to do a lot of this surveillance in the you know near patients and and in the field uh, in you know, in the clinic, and I think that there's education around that that's really important from a public health standpoint. So how do we bring uh, physicians all over the world, and they have many problems to deal with and are generally under resourced? How do we also bring them in uh, to thinking about? Uh, pathogens and really being careful about tracking those and, and making that part of their practices and how do we incentivize that. And I, I almost think that one, one helpful thing would be to bring in citizen scientists in a way that is to say, can, can we crowdsource uh, tracking of some of these pathogens? And again, it's, it's early and there are still technological advances to overcome. But we're very close to, to being able to have an early warning system. And maybe part of that is run by governments through their public health programs and, and with their physicians. Uh, but also it, it can be, uh, samples can be taken at other points. A good example uh, recently is uh, this had been done uh, for some years uh, in the bacteriology world and now is being applied to viruses as well, looking at things as simple as sewage outflows in different cities will give you an idea of, for instance, uh, which variants of COVID-19 are circulating uh, and the relative abundance of the different uh, variants in a specific city. So there are relatively inexpensive solutions. And I think that we somehow have to build this early warning system and it needs to be, it needs to be a group of people ranging from physicians mm -hmm. to public health officials, who are often also physicians, to citizens and and really needs to be made deployable with you know throughout the world in a way that is is cost effective and i i think this is not easy but it's something that we should build uh, thank you luis i will just comment here on the earlier detection uh, i fully agree that this is very important just one fact for you and for the audience uh, that uh, all we know how COVID-19 pandemic started. It was a Wuhan city in China, uh, end of November, beginning of December 2019. And uh, when people started to come to the hospitals and dying, anti antibiotics didn't work, treatment protocols didn't work, and then uh, there was some kind of alarm, something strange is happening here. And then how the COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, the virus was detected first time. But Post factum, uh, there was a research in Spain, in Barcelona. They took the samples of the wastewater uh, and they traced that COVID post factum, of course, uh, that uh, they traced that uh, 
COVID, uh, this virus, uh, which caused COVID-19 pandemic, was existing in the samples since 12, 13 of March 2019. And why it is Barcelona and why it is 12, 13 of March? Because just before that, there was a mobile World Congress, a World Mobile Congress, sorry, with 109,000 delegates, and more than 60% of the delegates came from Asia. It means that virus was existing in Spain nine months before uh, official detection in China. It means most probably in Asia, virus was existing even earlier. It means that the Probably the proper name for this pandemic is COVID-18, not COVID-19. And uh, here, if we could have nine months for preparation for development of the vaccines, of the treatment protocols, and so on and so on, possibly we could avoid this uh, mess which we all of us we faced. And uh, that's why early detection, I think, is a key element of uh, the strategy here. Uh, and uh, this could really block the pan pan epidemic even on the earliest possible stage. Okay, uh, please, uh, Mikhail, your ideas. Well, uh, first of all, I, I, uh, I'd like to point out uh, that we do not uh, need to rely on resources only on governments. It will not uh, enough to prevent or to predict future pandemics. So we need to, uh, to rely on resources from governments, from local authorities, from large uh, corporations from small and medium-sized businesses and so on. And the main uh, aim of the governments is to create uh, uh, good legal conditions and maybe to change laws because, as I mentioned, remote work is very important and labor law in many countries do not create comfortable conditions for remote work even today. Uh, about prediction, I think that in ideal world, if it is possible to predict all future pandemic, it will be a great situation. But I think that it is very, very difficult. For instance, the quality of meteorological forecasts today are still very poor. The uh, forecast of future pandemic is a much more complicated task because you need to uh, control all viruses, all pathogens among all animals, for instance not only among human population. So we need to pay attention to everything. So I don't think that we need to allocate all resources on one issue. And if we are ready to combine resources from citizens, from local authorities, from businesses, and from governments, I think it will be possible to achieve this goal, not only to focus on one issue, try to focus on different issues, because the system... I completely agree with Virginia that you need, we need to have different risk management system, corporate risk management system, government risk management system, and personal risk management system, because most of the population of the world don't think about personal risk management politics or personal risk management strategy. It's a very important part of our today life. Uh, it depends not on lockdown, it depends on your personal decision. Do we need, if uh, pandemics is around us, do we need to go to stadium to see football match or we need not to go, even if it is not prohibited. It's our personal decision. Uh, so it's quite complicated uh, um, task, but I think that if we allocate our resources on different issues, we will see some serious progress on some of the issues in the very, very near future. Thank you. Gary, your opinion? Yes, hi. Um, I agree. It's, it's, I don't, I think, um, prediction is very difficult. Um, and I think it needs to be a, a multi modal approach. Um, early detection. Um, I can't say much about that, but I, I definitely think that's a key in preventing, um, a large scale pandemic. But I also think, um, I also agree with Mika, what he just said, the personal risk management or with Virginia identifying invisible stake, so-called invisible stakeholders um, is key. Um, once you have the, have optimized processes, you need compliance. And um, I, what I'm seeing is um, a completely different approaches being taken with not only within the world, but in in one city, um, within schools, different schools are 
are uh, doing different things to protect the students, for example. Um, and you also need the personal um, risk management, like Mika said. Um, you, it, that won't work if education, I come back to education. It will not work if people are taking different types of information and making their own decisions. Um, we need some kind of, um, you know, we need to make, I think, science approachable to the general public. Needs to, science and research needs to be understood and, and accessible and approachable to the general public in order to get compliance. So we could set up the best system in the world, but if the, if the general public isn't, isn't following it, isn't on, in one boat, um, it's not going to work. So that's, that's what I think. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Unfortunately, our time is already a lot of time exhausted, but uh, I think uh, all of us, we agree that we need to allocate and spend resources and efforts now uh, and try to uh, prevent the next pandemic, which could possibly come, uh, instead of sit and wait and uh, act as a disease with the dealing with the consequences. This is the this is very good result from our brainstorming session. And also we managed uh, to produce some proposals uh, for the governments, uh, for the even international organizations we touched a little bit, and also for the private sector. And uh, thank you very much for your input, for your contribution to the session. I think it was quite interesting. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, th thanks uh, to Dr. Frank Richter for allowing us to keep the session during the Horasis Asia meeting. Thank you and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.